Okay, before everyone slits their wrists. Um, so I think that Leo is quite right, and I want to, before I actually start, I want to read something that I read in the Washington Post yesterday. Now remember, Donald Trump calls the Washington Post bogus and rigged and whatever, um, but that's my point in terms of this little paragraph that I want to read. Part of the broader assault Trump is mounting on almost every institution of public life in America, the government, the media, the education system, and even democracy itself. Think about it. That's what he's mounting. And he's done it from the beginning, not only spreading lies in a volume never seen before, but arguing that the established authority cannot be trusted. Unemployment numbers, remember, fiction. The justice system, bogus. Elections, rigged. So almost anything he dislikes, he'll just raise this, which then becomes part of what the conspiracy theorists think about as real. And in the confusion and the rootlessness that remains, and this is the terror that I think Leo was talking about, the only choice is to go to a strong man who will govern by his whip. So when Leo actually pulls together issues like, um, you know, the cabinet secretaries, what Trump is doing in terms of the media, what he's doing in terms of the labor movement, what he's doing about education, they all have, they're all connected in the way of essentially the horrible story that happened at a pizza place that many of us and our families in this room have gone to. Now, you can't fight things. The reason I start there, even though it's a little off from what I, my prepared remarks, you can't fight something unless you understand it. And one of the things that many of us do in the fight against authority is that we too create a sense that that authority, the boss, can't be trusted. They've taken a lot of tactics we use, but we believe we use those tactics for valiant reasons and for valuable reasons, and we believe that they use those tactics for terrible and awful reasons, and the misrepresentations are far different than anything I would hope I've ever done. But just think about what that means. Because part of what I will preach today is part of the most important thing we can do is create connection with people, create trust, engagement within the broader labor movement and then concentric circles and within community. I often say community is the new density, and it's never been more true than it is today. But if we don't actually create engagement and trust, not just have a great idea, but create engagement and trust, then he is incredibly good. You've just seen him. Do not ever underestimate him. He's a reality TV star. He is incredibly good at mass manipulation. What changes that? Engagement, trust, with a message of hope and aspiration. So, you're terrified? Engage people. Create circles of trust with a message of hope and aspiration, not simply anger. So those of you who are in our union, who are here today, you're going to hear me say that. I see Celia shaking her head. You're going to hear me say that a lot this week, a lot. Because our union has always been about 
not just calling it out, but figuring out what the solutions are. And the solutions cannot be to out-anger Mr. Trump. The solutions have to be around how we build a better future for the people in America. And frankly, it's both the people we represent and the people we serve. And that was what our goal was on November 7th, and that is what our goal is on November 9th, and that is what our goal is on December 5th. So having said that, how does that work with the topic that we have today? And in some ways, the topic we have today is part of the reason there is so much anger and so much mistrust. We think about precarious labor um, as, you know, as, as people who are in home health care, people who don't have um, full, who've come into our country from other countries and are um, doing the work that, you know, the Americans that have been here for a long, long time don't want to do. We think about precarious labor as the freelancers who can't get full-time jobs, even though many freelancers want to work exactly the way they are. But I would actually argue that the issue about precarious labor ran right through the Rust Belt. Think about it. Xerox, Kodak, names of companies that don't really exist anymore. IBM, completely different than it was before. Ford, GM. In the period of time when the labor movement was on its ascendancy, corporate America had a very different social compact with its employees and with the country than it has right now. And that social compact, even though there are lots of fights and lots of you know, um, issues around collective bargaining. Remember, Walter Ruther, Albert Shanker, others. The norm was a career in an employment setting. The norm in America, unlike Western Europe, was the healthcare and pensions to be funded by and carried by the employer. All that has changed. In fact, by the mid 2000s or the late 2000s, 80% of private sector employees no longer had pensions. So if you take a steel worker from Youngstown who no longer is in that mill because the mill is closed, and you ask that person about his retirement income, I suspect that person would say that in 2005 or in 2000, he was expecting to have $5,000 a month on top of Social Security. Today, he might be having $1,000 a month or even less than that on top of Social Security. I use my dad. My dad was laid off from Laurel Corporation. If he wasn't laid off, and he worked till his, I'm sorry, from Curtis Wright. If he wasn't laid off, and he worked at Curtis Wright for all the time that he anticipated working at Curtis Wright, he would have had a pension on top of Social Security of probably 25, 30, 35, maybe $40,000 a year. In $2,000, that would probably have been fifty or $60,000 a year. Instead, because he was laid off, 
and because he you know, did all sorts of odds and ends jobs, and then got back into the defense company when he was older, the pension he carried when he actually retired was $1,000 a month. My dad's not different in that regard than so many of the white, displaced, working class who are carrying Trump signs. So when we think about precarious labor, we not only should be thinking about what happens on the front end, but also what has now happened because the nature of work has so changed. And what do we as a labor movement or as people who believe in the dignity of work, we should all take on what the Pope has said, work is fundamental to the dignity of a person. But we have to make it dignified. So we need to actually think about this precariousness, this contingency, and figure out, even though the world has changed, obviously, on November 8th, and figure out how we do craft solutions that will actually meet the problem of how to stabilize and how to lift up wages, not just wages today, but deferred wages when people retire. And that, I think, at least from my perspective, that, I think, is part of our mission. Let me talk about not just um, private sector workers, but let me actually make this um, real in terms of one group of workers, private or public, that we are representing a lot and that we focus on a lot, and that's academic employees. So number one, my first point is, this is an issue that goes across our nation. It's an issue for black workers, it's an issue for brown workers, it's an issue for Asian workers, it's an issue for native workers, it's an issue for female workers, and it's an issue for white workers. And one of the things I'll say, or that, that, that I'm getting really sick and tired of hearing people say, is this is not an either or situation. We need to focus on economic anxiety of all people. And we also need to focus on stopping racial bigotry, sexual mis uh, misogyny, and all of the other biases that are obstacles to bring people down. This is a both and. And those who say it's an either or are walking right into Donald Trump's trap of divide, divide, divide. So that's why I raise the issue about precariousness from, not, from the perspective that we wouldn't normally talk about. So let me talk for a minute about where we see precariousness in some of the work we do at the AFT. Higher education. In the 1970s, 70% 70 of academic employees were tenured or on a tenure track. That's now completely flipped. Today, 70% of academic work is performed by more than one million contingent and non-tenured track workers. Many lack employer-provided benefits, not just, obviously, um, pension benefits, but health care benefits. Of AFT's 230,000 higher ed members, 80,000 are contingent and 25,000 are graduate employees. And let me just say, we are going full on in, you know, organizing graduate employees, even though I am, you know, as certain as almost anybody else is in this room that uh, some school will race back to the NLRB to try and reverse that. But when people want to be organized and they create the conditions of it, including working amongst themselves to create organizing committees, we at the AFT are going to help them organize and are going to help them have that voice. So how has higher ed gone from a haven of secure fairly decently compensated labor 
with workers having a great control over their working conditions to now. So much control that the Supreme Court in this yeshiva decision said that they were, ma that they were managerial as opposed to workers. So, <coughs> excuse me, one answer can be seen in the divestment in higher education from state governments, forcing institutions to focus on and lift their own tuition. More than 95% of states are spending less on public higher education than they did before the Great Recession. And so, and, 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 and at the same time, you also see rising student debt and the move to low cost precarious labor. Those things don't happen in a vacuum. They are pretty much um, consistent with each other. You spend less, institutions have to find more money in different ways, and they're also gonna try to do everything they can to reduce labor costs. This logic of austerity has infected universities. Their mission becomes not about the research and the dissemination of new knowledge and helping students fulfill their potential, but they start thinking about how to reap returns from customers. Think about it. The new football stadiums, the new housing, they start looking at their students and their donors as customers and as their self as branding as opposed to what their original mission is, which is the knowledge of students and the knowledge of America. So there's a lot of human cost associated with work becoming more precarious. And anyone, let me ask, anyone in this room ever been an adjunct without another job? So you know, I assume, from what I speak. The uncertainty about whether or not there's going to be a job next semester. The economic anxiety about having to cobble together five or six different things. The the meaning of a profession that somebody doesn't even have any kind of office or phone. Yes, I know we all have mobile phones now or smartphones, but that office hours become held in a car or in the neighbor, you know, in the nearby Starbucks or other kind of, you know, coffee shop and you're always looking for does anybody have Wi-Fi anywhere? This is the norm for contingent labor in universities now, not the exception. And then what about the shifts, unpredictable shifts, throwing schedules and family life way in disarray. And as I said before, not knowing what the paycheck is gonna be like from semester to semester. And feeling like you're running in place and never getting ahead like on a hamster wheel. So all of this is part of, and I didn't even talk about being one illness away from bankruptcy. If you have no health insurance and all of a sudden, God forbid, you or somebody in your family gets a, disability, gets a disabling illness. So this creates great anxiety on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis. And as a result, think about the imbalance of power between an employer and anybody who is a precarious laborer, who can just be fired for any reason or no reason at all. So now that I've gotten you even more depressed, the question now becomes, and this is what I want to just take a couple minutes of and then I'll stop. Okay, what do we do about this? Now, frankly, if Hillary had actually won the Electoral College, since she has actually won the popular vote, so if she had actually won the Electoral College and been elected under our Constitution, we would have been spending a lot of time, and probably fighting with them too, about how to change the law, you know, whether it is using what I think 
to be um, Rick Kallenberg and Moshe Marvit has written persuasively about changing the Civil Rights Act to make labor organizing a civil right. Um, many of us have talked about you know, looking back at that Smith versus Arkansas case from 1979, which held that the First Amendment freedom of association rights do not guarantee the right to collective bargaining in the public sector, but that was before Citizens United and a whole bunch of cases that have very much broadened for the purposes of corporations um, voice under the First Amendment. And so, you know, and, and some of us have talked about really taking on the issue of independent contractor versus employee. So if there was an administration that we had been supporting and, and an administration that actually believed that labor was an engine to shared prosperity and the labor movement is an engine to shared prosperity, we would have been spending a lot of time really looking at how you change a legal landscape to promote this. But obviously, that changed on November 9th. And, you know, maybe it will change back in 18, maybe it will change back in 20, but that changed on November 9th. So the questions then become, how do we create sustainable forms of union organization in this environment, when the workplace is in flux, when the environment has changed in this kind of way? And let me just say this. The people who first started the labor movement in the private sector and the public sector, they didn't have the National Labor Relations Act. We didn't have in Wisconsin public sector bargaining or in New York. In New York, I remember Al Shanker telling me stories about how anybody who would go on strike would immediately get fired under whatever the Conlon Wadlin law was and all the other awful things that it required. So, it's not that this is a good situation, I'm not arguing that, but it's not the first time we've had this situation. So we have to think about what, both what kind of structure and what kind of action. And frankly, some of the structures that we have right now work and some don't. So traditional union structures conceived decades ago, not built terribly well for precarious labor. I'll give you one example. An adjunct union might struggle to employ an organizer if the members work across three or four different campuses with three or four different locals. And in our union, when somebody is a contingent worker, they pay less dues. We have it in our constitution in terms of what the due structure is. But what then happens in terms of the locals is that they don't have enough wherewithal to create you know, full-time staff or full-time organizers. And then when the workforce turns over every semester, you're spending a lot of time organizing and connecting to members instead of that. Frankly, exactly what the people who brought the Friedrichs case in the first place want from everybody else. That's their goal, to destabilize, destabilize, divide. And so you don't have that kind of stability and that kind of ability to build. So we got to find a different way. And frankly, what SEIU has been doing in terms of their fight for 15 is to try to find a different way and try to create new organizational structure based on the value system and then create the infrastructure based upon the fight for and then create the infrastructure. It's why we spend, as much as I absolutely love and adore them, we have, we at the AFT, have a tremendous relationship with the freelancers union, but not just an affinity relationship. When the freelancers union in New York decided that they were gonna go after wage theft, we helped them, not just the UFT in New York City, but the AFT. And then we're trying to think about, for example, in Philadelphia and other places, given this situation, should we have one local for all the different adjunct um, adjunct workers in you know five or six or seven different colleges, and can we do what the old ACTWU did, what the old the old clothing workers, textile workers did, what Unite Here still does, particularly now if we don't know what's going to happen in terms of ACA, and have kind of like a medical hub that creates that. I'm talking about what are the different structures we can do that are not simply collective bargaining with the boss. 
really thinking about those different structures. But the question becomes, what do you organize around? What is the glue that binds people? And remember what I said at the beginning, the trust and the connection. How do you create the trust and the connection around aspiration and hope as opposed to just anger? Do you organize around the creation of knowledge? Do you create one big union based upon wages? Do you organize geographically? And that's the kind of thing we have to think about. And as I said, we have a project with AAUP in Philly, which we call the United, which they call the United, not AAUP call, but the workers gave it a name, the United Academics of Philadelphia. And what we're doing there is we're trying to raise the wage floor for low paid workers across the city. The adjuncts at Temple were the first in that group to win recognition but they only want it because of all the cross-union support and community solidarity. <clears throat> then, I want to raise one other issue, which is this. Sometimes, just like in the days before we had any legal um, law or any legal predicate for doing this, we just figure out how to organize, and don't stop until somebody tells us to stop, and then try to find a different way, or engage in civil disobedience, or do any of these kinds of things. And I'm gonna, I, we did this in New York for the home childcare workers across New York State, and we did this with the help of CSEA, AFSCME, the old and the old acorn. And what we did was we saw after the welfare reform that President Clinton did, you had a tremendous growth of people who were being paid by TANF funds, childcare workers, who were as pauperized as anybody else. And so we thought, let's figure out how to organize them. And this was not typical organization for the AFT. We would organize people typically in you know, early childhood who were about to work in a public school system or who were working in Head Start or you know, who were working at other childcare entities. I'm getting that right, right? But here, a lot of people were working in their homes. And so what we did is we actually organized them first and then tried to change the law in New York State to allow that to happen. And we failed in the state legislature, but the governor, I think it was two governors ago, so Governor Pataki refused to help us in any real way, but Governor Spitzer did and signed an executive order that enabled it. That same, unfortunately, executive order that was at issue in the Harris versus Quinn case in um, Illinois, but in New York, because there was some differences and because we frankly have a governor that even though he gives us some agita at times, we could work with on the value system of labor having a voice. So I think there's lots of different alternatives here that we can pursue. Part of what you're doing today is thinking about how to approach this. And the most important thing I can say is do not give up. There is anxiety abounding in this society today. Leo went through so much of it. The people who are against us want us to give up. They want us gone. No doubt the pick for labor will be just as special 
as the pick for treasury and the pick for education. Think about this. Why do they spend so much time wanting the voice of people and opportunity for people in a broad-based way to be gone? Why do they spend so much time doing it? Because they know the people united will not be divided. They know when people actually have both power at a ballot box and at the bargaining table, we lift incomes. They know if they can divide civil rights from economics, they can divide the working class in America. Don't give up. But what we need to do is figure out what's really going on and how to address the precarity and how to do it in new forms that don't immediately mean going to the federal government to change the law, going to the states, doing it on our own, coming up with many new deals, but how to actually take these steps forward so that we can actually help people meet their aspirations and dreams through their collective voice. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Randy. I think we can um, proceed to the first panel. <laughs>